I think we've gotten everyone in. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And I'm joined by my colleague, Peter Gao, who is the Independent Curriculum Consultant for One Schoolhouse. And Peter, before I introduce our guest, you and I have seen a lot of conversation about teacher morale going on, haven't we? We sure have, Sarah, and I uh, just, just finished a conversation with a friend uh, moments ago on this very topic. It's very, very important this year, and it's really going to be at the center, I think, of how successful the school year we're able to pull off for ourselves and, of course, for our students and our families. Mm -hmm. right. really we important. know, oh, I'm sorry. There's, we know that the lived experience of students in our schools is primarily their relationships with their teachers. And so that is the, the critical thing. So we invited our One Schoolhouse longtime associate, Lori Palco, and we're thrilled to have you here with us, Lori. So Lori is um, a former independent school educator and administrator, and then was with One Schoolhouse for a little while and is now a certified professional change cycle consultant and executive coach. And Lori, you recently taught a course at One Schoolhouse on building trust with faculty. And I'd love to um, have you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and then we're gonna dive right in. Okay, well, thank you everyone. It's, it's great to be with you today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I think it's almost 20 years now that I've been associated with independent schools, working in independent schools, and or um, coaching and consulting with leaders in schools. And 20 years in business and almost 20 years in um, independent schools, what I, what I did in 2017 is I wanted to bring together my experience and my passion for helping leaders and organizations manage in uncertain times and times of transition. I started my own coaching and consulting business, Love Money Purpose. So I'm glad to be with here with all of you today. Great, well, thank you. So, you know, as Peter and I were talking, NAIS has been tweeting um, articles about teacher morale. It has been a conversation everywhere. Um, so why is it that adults in schools are feeling feeling this low morale. And I'm gonna remind everyone, if you've got a question, please put it in the Q&A. Well, as I just said, I was in business for 20 years working in the corporate world and now I've been working with independent schools. And what I find in terms of the difference of adults in schools versus adults in for-profit businesses is that educators care deeply and love the work that they do. They care deeply about each other, their students, families, the mission of the school. So they, they love what they do. And not saying that others don't, but I see it's very different with educators. They love the mission. They, and they also have a, a sense of responsibility for delivering on that mission and delivering for their students. And I think in this time of, of uncertainty and change that is unprecedented, that it just brings up a lot of uncertainty and a sense of loss and grief and doubt for educators that's unlike other employees and other individuals out in the, the workforce. Um, you know, they're probably questioning their competence. Can I, can I do school in this way? How do I connect with with students? How do we connect with each other? Um, there's concerns, I'm sure, about their own safety and, and showing up and being in person and doing their jobs and worrying about their own physical safety. So I think there's just a greater sense of, of loss and, and doubt that, that educators are feeling because also they're just so committed to the work that they do. The other thing I would say is that they didn't have a break you know, you were coming into the hard last part of the school year. In mid-March, you had to quickly pivot to distance learning. It was hard. And then a lot of educators, if not almost all, had to plan over the summer to deliver education in a different way, probably with higher expectations 
in the fall than they had in the uh, in the spring. So I think that contributes to the low morale as well. That's a great point. And um, I've been following conversations on social media. I belong to a few Twitter chats and Facebook and other groups. And one of the things that I've seen emerge lately is that leaders are feeling helpless, saying things like nothing that I can do seems to help. If you, I give people extra days off, they get stressed about what the work is that they're not doing. Um, in another thread, I saw a comment, I'm a middle-aged professional with a master's degree. If chocolate would help, I'd buy it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that that point is well made. And so, Lori, is it true that there's not anything that leaders can do? I can understand why they may feel that way, but there, there certainly are some things that leaders can do. And I think, I think first of all, is reframing their expectations and shifting their mindset about what this year is about. I think a lot of school leaders and administrators see themselves as, as problem solvers and they like to fix problems and make people feel better about situations. And I think this year it's, it's more about not how can I make people feel better, but how can I show up and be there for people and to listen to to faculty and to, to seek to understand what is going on with them. So I think it, it starts with a shift in, in mindset, Sarah, that my job is not about fixing things or making them feel better. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm there for them and I'm listening to them and I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, then I think we can communicate that their well-being as a person is what's important. And I want to understand how they're doing, not just the work that they're doing for the school. So I would encourage leaders to take the time, and I know they may feel like they don't have the time, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with faculty members. And as best you can, try to be fully present mentally and physically to those conversations and really seek to understand what's going on with them. The other thing I would say, Sarah, in my work as a change cycle consultant, that what we find that in, in times of, of great uncertainty, employees need high encouragement and high direction. So let me just first mention okay. that high encouragement, okay? Sure, tell us about both of those. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean being a cheerleader, okay? Um, what it what it means is in these conversations with faculty, help faculty to understand and reflect on, on all they bring in terms of their skill set to the work that's in front of them. Faculty are so much more than content experts. They have so many skills that they can draw upon. But right now, given that how they teach and how they interact and how they connect with students and each other is so different, they may need to really reflect on what they can do and the fact that they, they do have what it takes to, to navigate in this environment. So that the high encouragement is to help them see what they can bring to this situation and help them have some confidence that they can do this. Um, on the high direction side, uh, that may seem very counterintuitive that you- it doesn't sound very independent school, does it? <laughs> no, I mean, I know, I know when I went from the classroom at, at um, Atlanta Girls School uh, and then I, into operations and then to one schoolhouse, when I first taught online, it was the first time that everyone could be in my classroom and see what was going on. And, I, I wanted more autonomy. So I, I understand the autonomy and it doesn't feel like an uh, independent school way to have high direction. But I would say this, that anytime we're struggling with change and feeling overwhelmed and feeling uncertain, we need to have some success. We need to know that we're meeting the expectations that others have for us. We need to know that we're making progress. We need, we need to know that we're doing the right next thing. And 
it's it's no different than with students and with children. There's some boundaries that if if they're op if they can operate within those boundaries and those expectations, they can have success. And right now, I'm sure there's a lot of educators that don't feel like they have a lot of success because they're uncertain. Is am I doing this the right way? And mm -hmm. am I connecting with my students? So I think if if, it, if leaders can be clear about expectations, reinforce those expectations, um, encourage teachers that they, they can do this, it will give teachers a greater sense of certainty, a greater sense of, of success and what's familiar to them. And I think it'll give them a greater sense of safety. And I think all of that, given what we talked about in terms of what they're facing, could really help with that morale. Thank you. You've used that phrase before, the right next thing or the next right thing. Yes. And, um, and I think that's one that resonated. One of the challenges I think for academic leaders who are working with faculty is that um, we liken this in the course to the putting on your own oxygen mask. And so there, there are faculty who are in the midst of grieving what would, you know, the school year that they're not having, whether they're in person, whether they're remote, whether they're doing both, no matter what, it's not the school year. And it's not the October, the fun filled October where we're bringing out the pumpkins and we're really in the swing of things. Um, you know, people are already talking about being exhausted. And I think the same thing is happening for our leaders. Sure. Um, sure. And at the same time, how important is it for them to understand where they are in this process before they can or while they're working with faculty as well? Well, you mentioned the the oxygen mask, right? Um, hopefully we'll we'll be traveling again and getting on planes and hearing that you know you need to first put on your oxygen mask before you can can assist others. Well-being, um, our well-being is is up to us. Okay, um, and it starts with us. And I think we need to understand what is it going to take for each leader to be mentally and physically and spiritually healthy during these times, okay, to navigate the challenges that are going to be ahead. And no different than when we talk to students and we encourage them to advocate for what they need to have success in their learning. I think the same thing applies for school leaders in this case. You may not be getting high encouragement and high direction from, from the people above you, okay? That doesn't change what you need to do for yourself and how you need to advocate for your well-being. So it may be, um, after reflecting on that, professionally, you may, you may go to your boss and say, hey, I need more frequent communication. I need clarity on some of these um, expectations. It, is this something we need to do right now? This is what I'm sensing from faculty. Are there some things we can, can change? Whatever you need in terms of advocating <clears throat> for your needs, you need, to, you need to understand that and you need to do that. And this, I would say the same thing from a personal standpoint. It's hard to, you know, what, what we're dealing with professionally, we're, we're dealing with personally as well. You know, the uncertainty, the safety issues, the concerns. So I think it's really important that you know what you need to do to take care of yourself personally as well and advocate for that because it's gonna be a long haul. As you just mentioned, it's October. And as I said, we didn't have a break. So what you need to do to be mentally, physically, and spiritually fit for this year, you need to understand what that is and advocate for that and keep advocating for that. Right. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions already. And uh -huh. uh, one I'm gonna share with you, which is that, uh, Permission to do less isn't necessarily sitting well with faculty who have really high internal standards and who are struggling with not being able to meet the standards that they've set for themselves this year. And so when we say, 
you know, you can, you can ditch this. I, I've been calling it permission to ditch. That's not necessarily um, okay with a teacher. And so therefore some time off doesn't necessarily, you know, an unexpected holiday doesn't necessarily soothe that or, or speak to that. So can you talk a little bit, not so much about how teachers should change their standards for themselves, but how leaders can talk to teachers who are struggling with this in a way that's empowering? Sure. Uh, it's always going to be hard for any of us, right? Because we, we do have those high internal standards. What I would say is go back to these one-on-one -on -one conversations that I think are so important for school leaders to have with teachers. And I think the first thing is try to help teachers do for themselves and recognize what they can do for themselves, similar to what they would do for, for their students. And I, one of the things I would say is help them um, be more forgiving of themselves and just listen to what the teachers are saying about why they're, they're resisting giving up some standards and what that is about. So you can, you can help them move beyond that, beyond those internal standards. So I talked about reframing the job of school leaders this year, right? And it's really about connecting and relating and being there for faculty. I would say, talk with teachers about how they can reframe what this year is about, okay? Schools are learning organizations. They're all about teaching and learning. I would, if I was a school leader, I'd be having conversations with faculty members about what are their goals and objectives this year that has nothing to do with pedagogy and content. But what can, what can they learn about themselves? What are their goals? How can they connect? So try to shift that it's it's not about the same expectation because this year is like no other year so i would i would come back to that the other thing i would do is i would i would um try as administrators to think of some specific things that maybe you can take off teachers plates so yes you want to have conversations that they can um, work through their goals and objectives and their expectations and reset them themselves. But administration can also help by taking some things off teachers' plates. This is a time to really analyze what's important for the teachers and for the school. So that's how I would ask them to reframe what this is about. It's not like any other year. I really like the way you said shift expectations, because I think that is rather than saying that we're lowering them, we're shifting them. And that is not necessarily reactive, it's responsive, right? And there's some subtle differences between the two, right? We react to things sometimes in a moment because we have to, and that kicks off that lizard part of our brain. Yeah. But when we respond, it's a measured um, decision. Kind of yeah, and I'm, I'm sure teachers are doing um, different things with their students to engage them in um, go beyond the content in the classroom and allowing the flexibility to do that. And so I think it's this, it, so the expectations have shifted for students probably this year to some degree. I talked about shifting for leaders. I think the same thing applies for, for teachers. How can, how can they grow? Um, what can they learn? How can they connect and relate in a different way without it feel, feeling like they have to do more? Okay, one of the things that, that concerns me with, with schools is we always think we have to do more when, when something new is, comes up. Well, sometimes we just have to shift and we have to take some things off people's plates. That is a great point. And so I wanna just remind everybody, if you've got a question, put it in the Q&A. Um, so that's where I can sort of keep track of those and make sure that we feed them to Lori. And Lori, one of those is, are there any things um, to avoid, any red flags of things not to say? 
when you're engaged in a conversation? That's a good question. Um, you know, we're all dealing with with all this this change and uncertainty and school being different than it was before. Um, so it's it's hard when we're when we're dealing with all of this to show up and be fully present. What I would say is in these conversations, really try not to make it about yourself when you're talking with a, with a teacher and really be aware of and observe your thoughts. So if you're having a conversation with a teacher, observe what you're thinking or are you immediately observing what you need to say or how you need to respond to what they're telling you? Are you thinking you need to fix something? Are you making judgments about what they're, what they're saying, you know, as soon as they start talking? Are you thinking about the last Zoom call you were on or the hundred emails that you need to get to? Try to observe how quickly it goes back to everything that, that's going on within us. So just observe that. Um, we want teachers to feel fully heard and fully seen this year, just like we want our students to feel heard and seen, and we don't want any teachers to fall through the cracks. So if, if we're listening and we're not making it about ourselves, here's, a, here's an example. I'm sure this has happened to all of us, okay? And we've all done it. Someone comes to us with an issue or a problem, and you know, let's just example, a teacher comes with how hard it is or they're struggling, and you might immediately go into Oh, I know it's really hard. You realize yesterday I had X Zoom calls and I had to do this, this, and this isn't about you. This is about the person in front of you that you want to communicate. You care about their well-being, and you care about what is going on with them and help them come up with some ways that, that they can take some action and feel better about what's going on. Okay, so that that response might be an instinctive, oh, I can identify with you, we're in this together, and yet it's actually disempowering. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with saying, I, I, I'm I, sorry, I understand how you feel. I mean, you want to show empathy and compassion, but you don't want to do that where all of a sudden it becomes about you and what you're going through and you giving advice because right away it I think it shuts you down and I know we've all had those conversations I know we've all done that and that's why I think it's really important about being present and in active listening where you're listening holistically to what the other person is saying so it can be disempowering um, certainly we want to show compassion and we are in this together but we need to make sure that it's it's not a narrative that's about us even it even if we're not saying it sometimes what we're thinking uh, it may be that's great um so one of the questions here um says the question about teachers physical safety and health makes this a more difficult leadership challenge do you have ideas about how to help them with this aspect and i'm thinking about teachers who maybe must be present on campus or that's the expectation and they don't have a, um, it, it, where it's really gray, right? Whether or not you have to be there. Yeah, I, um, we're always at choice, right? Um, in terms of, of how we, we um, choose to either be there or not. What I would say is this is again where the conversations and trying to help teachers um, go deeper in terms of what, what really is their concern. Is it just a general concern about you know, getting ill in, in this environment or are there some specific concerns with, within the building, within their classes, within the um, structure that you can address? So we want to, in these one-on-one -on -one conversations, we can ask a lot of powerful questions that can deepen the learning for the person in front of us. We want to get by the surface answer of, I don't feel safe to what, what really is challenging you. And you may be able to fix it or you may not. 
But again, at least them being able to express it um, will, I think, help and for them feeling like they've been heard. I don't know what the specific answers are, but I, I trust that the, the leaders can figure that out if they can really understand what's behind it. And there, there may come a point where a school academic leader might need to call on the business office and talk about, you know, what are our options for leave for someone if we are between a rock and a hard place where someone just really doesn't feel safe coming to school and yet that expectation is there. Um, sometimes those conversations, I'm not trying to say, you know, that it's black and white because it's not, but it's, you know, sometimes it does get to that point. And I think that's a little bit beyond what we're, we're talking about here. And then um, a question here is, what about when a faculty member really wants a leader to take a specific action that that leader might not be able to do? Um, is there a way to have that conversation in a, in a healthier way? Yeah, I, I think having direct conversations and communication um, when I when I talk about communication, I talk about you know people have different communication needs, so they they may need to know why a decision can't be made. They may need to know how that decision was made. Um, they need to need to know the details of what what is that decision about. Really, you know, what is it that you can't take that action? And to the degree that it's it's something you can share, I would encourage leaders to to share and, and be vulnerable where they can be on why some specific actions can't be taken um, or why some are taken. I think communication one-on-one -on -one and collectively in school communities is critical this year. I think it always is, but especially this year. I think that's a great point. And we've got a couple of questions that are related around communication, which is this idea that we are making policies in real time. And sometimes we're making them super fast. And as you pointed out, the more we can explain the background, the better for people who have that high need. But for other folks, if they end up in a Zoom meeting when they've got six other things going on and they need to, and somebody, you know, lays out step by step and here's how we responded to this letter from the state and then the county said this, that's the person you may lose in that time. So I think being able to customize. And one of the things that we do in our courses is we make videos that people can watch if they really want to get into the detail and they could watch all the way through. And that might be a strategy for a leader when there's a high need for communication, but only among a certain segment. Um, are there other strategies that leaders can use when things are changing fast? Yeah, I think I think you hit on it, Sarah. Um, you know, just like every, every learner is different, every, every teacher, every employee is different in terms of their communication needs. I would first of all, first, and, and talk about um, the fact that we are going to be making some changes on the fly and it's out of necessity. And because of that, um, there are, ask for some forgiveness around communication. If, if something, if you feel like something didn't get communicated. I would also say that it's really important to have different communication methods. So it may be email, it may be a short video, it may be a, an all school meeting. Um, there's, there's different ways of communicating. I think you need to know your community and know your culture and what works best. But if you have those different communication needs, the information is going to get out um, and people can, can um, you know, tune into what meets their needs. So I think we earlier had a communications consultant and I think um, share some strategies and I think uh, that might could be useful for some folks too, especially when they get into a possibly contentious community. And there's a question here about how do we, when families are pushing back and we've got tension between teachers and families and administrators, how do we how do we help those uh, different constituents understand each other? And I think that can be, um, that's a really big question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't wanna sound like I'm taking a pass on that, but it is a very big question. And I think that's one where um, 
an expert in sort of campaigns and strategies. If you've gotten to the point where, you know, something that's happening at your school has made it into the newspapers, which has happened to quite a few schools, for example, um, you want a big strategy on that. Yeah. Sure. Can I just add that this is background noise for many teachers. It, it, it seems to be regional. I'm in the Northeast where it seems to be a, a hotter issue uh, where um, administrators, the school leaders are under pressure from very vocal um, and well-meaning, I think, groups of, of parents um, and sometimes the board gets involved and that blows up into uh, Facebook incivility and, you know, rips in the social structure that holds schools together in so many ways. And that's background noise for teachers on top of a very contentious uh, political situation that we're in and uh, on top of um, some very important thinking that schools are now having to do uh, and work that schools are now having to do around um, equity and social justice. And I'm sort of wondering whether Lori has any thoughts on how you, you can't insulate teachers from this because it's, you know, they may have kids who are students in the school. Um, how do how do administrators either compartmentalize or do whatever they need to do to support teachers if the community if the sort of the background noise in the community is 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 hurting everyone hurting everyone's ears and uh, and souls sometimes yeah I, I mean teachers know it's going on so we we can't we can't ignore it because it's like you said there's a lot of noise there so they're not only dealing with all this but they're hearing these other potential issues that their school leaders are having to deal with. And it may impact like, you know, what's gonna to happen to the school and are we gonna lose enrollment and how it impacts my job. So all of that could be going on um, in teachers' minds. I, I, again, I think it goes back to school leaders need to be frequently communicating and they may not be able to communicate some of the specifics about any issues that are out there, but I think they have to communicate that that we're on this, we're, we're discussing this. If there's things we learn from this that we need to change, we'll be talking to you about this. Um, but I think it's, it's about helping teachers focus on what they need to focus on. If leaders have to deal with some of these issues, they do, but they need to be communicating. And again, it's what's causing some of the, the, the need for policy changes that you may reference to Sarah that something comes up and so we got to change something. Um, I think we need to over communicate in this environment. Again, not in terms of all the specifics. And if you can't answer a question because of, there's a legal issue or something, you can say that. But if you're out there communicating, at least they know that you're, you're on it, you're, you're focused on what's right for the school, you're focused on the mission and the the plan and the values of the school and we're here to, to help you do that for your students. So leaders need to be able to communicate that they've got this to faculty and we're going to keep you informed as best we can and as timely as we can. So I love that you brought it back to the mission again. That's where I was going to go as well, which is reminding families that they they are in agreement with you. They chose your school because of the mission and that you are living your mission under extraordinary and difficult times and so are the teachers. So we're gonna close with a very practical and tactical question that I um, saved for here because I think it's a great takeaway or exit ticket as folks go out. But what are some suggestions for question prompts to help in one-on-one -on -one meetings between an academic leader and a faculty member that can help them have a fruitful conversation. Okay. Um, short questions um, are always the best. I like to ask how and what questions rather than why questions. Because a lot of times when we start a question with why did you or why didn't you, it immediately puts someone on the defensive. So if we can ask short questions what questions or how questions designed to deepen the learning, no different than, than essential questions that we ask in the classroom. 
so that we can take someone on a journey of deepening their own learning. So um, right now, let's go back to the, the teacher expectations. You know, one question, one of my favorites is, what is the gift in this situation? Where do you have choice? What would success look like? Um, how, how might you take a step forward? Um, what, what is, what could be done differently? Um, they're just some of the questions, but again, think of it about how you deepen the individual's learning and thought process so they can come up with the answers themselves. Again, rather than the leader thinking they have to fix something or make the teacher feel better. They can get there on their own by asking powerful questions. I think that is such a great takeaway. And so, Lori, thank you so much for being here today. And, you know, as our academic leaders head out, I think that idea of everything that comes in the door isn't something for you to fix, because as an academic leader, you do fix a lot of problems every day. And sometimes it's not about fixing something. No, it isn't. Thank you, everyone. It's been great to, to be with you and love the questions. Thank you. And um, if you'd like more Lori, she is running her workshop again, her, her course for us again. It's a one week course on building trust with faculty. And we'd love to have some of you join us. Love to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.